Let's pray. And we just did, but let's pray again in the, uh, in the, um, the St. Michael prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Finally, you got to hear me talk about something other than John. <laughs> Today we're talking about the Gospel of Mark. And I say, uh, Terror of Demons is what I subtitled it. Terror of Demons is what I subtitled it. Uh, Terror of Demons is the t uh, title of whom? Joseph. Very good. You guys have been uh, paying attention to this year of St. Joseph. Um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, something, uh, something of Joseph rubbed off on Jesus for all those uh, 30 years, because uh, he is certainly the Terror of Demons as well, uh, the first Terror of Demons. And unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the, wor the title wording kind of covers up, but this is... Um, Behind the, the title, you can kind of vaguely make out somebody on the ground. Uh, that somebody is the demoniac in the first chapter of Mark in the synagogue. That's what we're going today. Uh, Mark chapter 1 uh, starts, I want to say, verse 20-ish. Um, Mark. What can you tell me about Mark? What can you tell us about Mark? Anything. What do you know about Mark? They say Paul had a Jewish writing. Yes, he was a scribe. Um, he's sometimes called John Mark in uh, the New Testament uh, epistles. So he was with Paul for a time, and he trained with Paul. And then eventually he came to Rome and trained with St. Peter. So traditionally, that's um, where uh, we attribute Mark's source he is basically recording St. Peter's experiences. So he wrote for Peter and Paul? Basically, yes. Uh, what else can you tell me about Mark? What, what else can you tell the class about Mark? Did he write to the Gentiles? Did he write to the Gentiles? Um, certainly his gospel is meant to be read for everyone. But the, the thing is, his gospel was first written for Christians. His first audience is Christians. Specifically, the church in Rome. Mark was in Ro uh, Rome at this point with Peter. And as best we can figure, Mark is writing in about the year 60, mid-60s, so like 65. Um, it was common for a time to say that Mark was written later. Uh, the reason for that was that at the end of his gospel, Mark gives a whole bunch of, uh, well, Jesus, Mark's Jesus gives a very detailed prediction of the fall of Jerusalem. Now, that happens in the year 70. And scholars basically said it's too detailed. Uh, it's too specific. So it has to be history. It can't be a prophecy. And the assumption is no one can prophecy in detail. As Christians, we don't you know, we don't, we don't give any credence to that assumption, so we are perfectly comfortable saying Mark was written in the 60s, that Jesus was giving detailed predictions about the fall of Jerusalem. But more importantly, year 60 uh, is when uh, the persecution of the emperor Nero was happening. Now, this was to date the worst persecution that the Christians had ever faced. Um, Nero, of course, is the guy who uh, supposedly um, fiddled while Rome burned to the ground. And so uh, that's one of Mark's main goals when he's writing this. He's writing to the church. Uh, specifically, a church to this point has not had a gospel, right? Mark is the first to write a gospel. And so up to this point, what they had are Paul's letters, um, some of Paul's letters, some of uh, the other letters, um, and these kind of oral traditions about Jesus. Of course, a lot of these people would have known Jesus, right? This is year 60. Jesus dies at about the year 30, 33. And so Jesus is still living memory. But 
to this point, no one has yet written down a definitive account. This is Jesus. And your experience has to match up with this Jesus. That's what Mark is doing. And this Jesus, of course, again, killed as a blasphemer, rejected by his people, um, and put on display as a criminal by the Roman authorities. By all accounts, this Jesus was a failure. And so Mark has to explain how this Jesus is worth following to people who are being killed for following him. Why on earth would anyone want to follow this guy when we're being slaughtered by the day? And so that's Mark's goal. Just like John, he's trying to explain the cross, why it's worth being persecuted, and why, in fact, our persecution is our participation in the cross and the passion and death of Jesus Christ. Just like St. Paul says, if we die with him, then we rise with him. But Mark is not John. He gives his own sort of emphases, his own sort of style. And if you uh, look at the Gospel of Mark, it is the shortest of the Gospels, 16 chapters. Um, and his style is very unique. Uh, one of his favorite words, uh, immediately, euthus in Greek, immediately Jesus did this, went there. And you get the sense that this Jesus is very much motivated and driven with purpose. Everything he does is intentional. John's Jesus, right, he's always stopping to give these long sort of theological discourses, these deep teachings. Um, Matthew and Luke, he's always uh, teaching in parables or meeting people and uh, stopping on the way. Mark's Jesus is very much, I am going to the cross. Everything I am doing is leading me toward the cross. Get on board or get out the way. That's Mark's Jesus. And this mission that Jesus has is kind of the best way to understand the Jesus of Mark. Um, we said that for John, if you, want to, if you want to understand Jesus in one phrase, it's son of the father. I would say for, for Mark, the, the, the short little phrase that best describes Jesus, it's the man on a mission, a mission from God. Everything he is, everything he does is part of this mission. It's him furthering this mission. Uh, so what's the mission? It has to do with the symbol of Mark. John's the eagle. Mark is the lion. Any guesses why? Mark's gospel starts in the desert. So lions you associate, at least in the Jewish imagination, with the desert. Is roaring out from the desert with this power and this authority, roaring that the whole world is shaken to its bones and hears and either responds uh, in favor or uh, responds with rejection. It's this voice that cries out and cuts the world in half with power and with authority. That's Mark's gospel. That's Mark's Jesus, the lion. So what is this mission? Here we have a picture of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, this is Isaiah according to Raphael, who is uh, my favorite of the Ninja Turtles, by the way. Um, Mark's gospel explicitly starts like this, with a prologue. And just like John has a prologue, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, uh, was with God, and the Word was God. A prologue that is separate from the rest of the story and gives a kind of bird's eye view of what's going to happen, what are the major themes, what are we doing here. Mark is the same way. 
It's absolutely not true as it was claimed for a time that Mark is the least theological of the Gospels. The assumption was that if Mark is short and so to the point, he's just telling it like it is. And he's, uh, he's not um, inserting his own theology. That's not true at all. Mark is very much uh, theologically um, and artistically uh, a, a real artist of a writer. So he starts with this prologue, and he uh, starts by saying, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. He literally cites Isaiah. Um, but the thing is, he's kind of cheating here, because he says Isaiah, but actually this paragraph that he attributes to Isaiah is three different prophets. He's kind of uh, smushing them together and um, bringing them all under the, 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 the name Isaiah. Of course, Isaiah is the prophet. He is the greatest of the prophets, uh, at least in the Old Testament. Um, but he's, he's citing three sources here. Isaiah himself, Exodus, and Malachi. So we're going to start with uh, Exodus because Exodus is the first. Right at Exodus is the story of God's people being free from slavery. And so in Exodus 23, it's retelling the story, recounting the story, uh, and telling how God's messenger brings his people from Egypt to the promised land. And of course, even by this point, uh, the Jews see that there's something greater going on here. It's not just we're physically free, but God is bringing us from from darkness, from sin, into freedom, into light. Um, but as we all know, and as we saw last week, that doesn't last forever. The land is destroyed, the tribes split, the people are exiled and deported. And so that's when Isaiah is writing. Yeah? Isaiah is the prophet of the exile. And he's saying to these people who, who are losing the promised land that what God has done once, he's going to do again perfectly. It's not just going to be the land. In fact, you might not even get the land back. Now, they do get the land back, but there's, there's something missing, right? They're, they're still under Roman occupation. Isaiah is saying the more important thing is that God is really once and for all going to accomplish what he promised to do. God doesn't uh, renege on his promises. He is going to free us once for all from this interior slavery to sin and to darkness and bring us into freedom of the children of God. And of course, Isaiah is go going on to, uh, to say that God is going to fulfill this promise through his suffering servant. Right? If, you know, if you know anything about Isaiah, or if you remember anything about Isaiah, it should be this, is that Isaiah is the prophecy of the suffering servant, how God fulfills his promise. Of course, we're going to see that in a second. Finally, Malachi is the third of these prophets that, Isaiah, uh, that uh, Mark is kind of jumbling together into this, into this paragraph. And Malachi is kind of showing the flip side of Isaiah. He's saying, if it's once for all, it's apocalyptic. The world is going to end at this judgment, and the whole world will be judged. Those who are redeemed, those who are freed from sin and brought into the kingdom of God, and those who uh, do not heed and are going to be children of darkness forever. Malachi is saying this is for keeps. There is no neutral ground here. Everyone's either saved or condemned. So that's the first half of Mark's prologue, is the citation of the prophets that he kind of jumbles together. Um, all these prophecies of fulfillment. The second thing that happens in the prologue is this, baptism of Jesus. So he's citing these prophecies, and then he's saying, look, this guy is going to be the one who's going to fulfill it all. This guy. This Jesus of Nazareth is who my story is going to be about, and it's who is going to fulfill all these prophecies. He's going to be the suffering servant. 
And there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to, to pull out from the account of the baptism. It's only three verses, verses 9 through 11 of Mark chapter 1, but they're dense, super dense with uh, Old Testament prophecies and um, with sort of artistic flair. But the, the gist of it is this. He's anointed here. Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit, anointed like a king, right? Um, not with oil, but with the Holy Spirit. He is the new uh, David, the new prince of the kingdom of God. And he is here to bring about this kingdom. Uh, just like David was anointed as God's king and then uh, proceeded to make that kingdom real by uniting the tribes and expelling the foreigners, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's bringing about God's kingdom and he's going to cast out anyone who gets in his way, namely Satan's kingdom. And this is his mission. This is the mission of Jesus. Everything he does is going to be in service to building up the kingdom of God and destroying the kingdom of darkness. And he's going to do it through obedience to the Holy Spirit. Now, um, of course, there is something special to know here, a lot of special things. Um, Anyone tell me the difference between the Gospel of Mark's version of Jesus' baptism and the Gospel of Matthew's and Luke's? Fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. Blank, blank, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is? This is? That's Matthew and Luke. Mark says, you are my beloved son. What's the reason for that? The reason is that in, whereas in Matthew and Luke, Jesus is kind of on display for the whole world. The crowd is in awe. John the Baptist is in awe. In Mark, it's private. We don't even get any indication that anyone else is hearing God's word. You are my beloved son. And so this is what Mark is doing in this prologue. Right again, it is set off from the rest of the story. Uh, he's saying, this is what's going on here. You as my readers can see it. And in the story, God and Jesus can see it because they're on this spiritual plane. That Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. But as the story goes on, this is something that is going to play out through the rest of the story is this quote-unquote messianic secret. Has anyone ever heard this term before? This is a very common uh, way of describing one of the key themes in Mark, is this hidden identity of Jesus. And it's all about people coming to recognize the messianic secret. You look at the organization of Mark, 16 chapters, it's very short, but the halfway point is when Peter makes his confession. Uh, there's a picture here of, of Peter making his confession. Uh, it says, you are Christ, the Son of God. He finally recognizes the first human character to see that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Who's the other? There's only one other person to do it in all the Gospel of Mark. Not Mary. Mary isn't, uh, isn't very prominent in Mark's gospel. She's most prominent in Luke and in John. And which is precisely why we have the tradition, or rather I should say it, it uh, agrees with the tradition that, uh, that, of course, Mary lived with John for the rest of her life in Ephesus. And uh, Luke, um, in the sources he has, uh, was likely interviewing Mary. That's why Mary plays a very big role in uh, Luke and in John. And Mark, who's the only other person that recognizes that Jesus is the Christ. Are you John the Baptist? 
Even John the Baptist never says it. He never says it out loud. It's the centurion. It's the centurion. Surely this must be the Son of God. Very good. Surely this must be the Son of God. Uh, the presentation is in Luke. Yeah, it's not Mark. Um, the centurion. Uh, the soldier at the, at the crucifixion. So, the whole gospel is about getting to recognize that Jesus is the Son of God. Peter does it halfway point. After seeing Jesus' miracles, after following him on the way, he says, this must be the Christ. And that halfway point, then Jesus gets transfigured, he gets glorified, he's, he's um, confirming Peter, yes, you are correct, I am the Christ, look, I am glorious. But at that moment, the gospel shifts. At that point, it's all about Jesus foretelling his passion and death and resurrection, saying that the Son of, son of Man must suffer and die. He's predicting the end of the temple, and he's predicting his own suffering. It's like, to that point, recognize me in my miracles. Now that you have, I'm challenging you, recognize me also in my suffering. And that's the key, recognizing that the suffering of Jesus confirms and is true to his being the Christ. Remember, he's writing to an audience that is going persecute, undergoing persecution. Suffering is how we participate in Christ. And he's challenging his audience to recognize that and to accept that. And it's proven when uh, Mark says that the heavens here at the baptism, tear open. The heavens tear open and the Spirit comes down. And again, only one other time that Mark uses this word to tear. Any guesses? Temple curtain. Temple curtain. Very good. Very good. It's very intentional. Gospel uh, writers and, in fact, all these classical writers are very exact about their vocabulary. He's linking... Uh, the passion and death of Jesus to the baptism. What's going to happen here in this baptism that you, my audience, can see and none of the, the, none of the characters can see, what's going to happen here is going to be confirmed in secret, if you will, in, in, in hidden, hiddenness at the crucifixion. Once he's anointed with the Holy Spirit, uh, he is driven, immediately driven. Mark's uh, got kind of an interesting word choice here. Uh, that the mission is just as much the mission of the Spirit of God. And all Jesus is doing is being obedient to that mission. Being driven by the Spirit. We're out into the desert to fight Satan. So we're doubling down here. He's, he's crowned as the prince of the kingdom of God. And he immediately, after he receives this mission, goes out and fights Satan in the desert for 40 days. And that's going to be the reality, again, of what's going to happen through the rest of the gospel. He's doing in the desert, for, the, for his readers, what he's going to be doing in the towns for the rest of the story and for the characters in the story. He's going to be fighting Satan. He's not going to name Satan, but we're going to see it when he fights the demons. It's all about building up the kingdom of God and destroying the kingdom of Satan. Very, very charismatic. Straight out of the charisma. So, be, so all this is to say that that's Jesus' mission. And when we actually go into the story and see that mission played out, this building up and this tearing down, Jesus is going to do basically just two things. Just two things. And he's going to say it. When he appears on the scene, uh, verse 15, 
he says that Jesus appeared saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I am here. I am bringing my kingdom. I am creating my kingdom. Come get on board. How he's, how he's going to do that is two ways. He's going to heal the sick. And he's going to cast out demons. This is literally all Jesus does in Mark. He doesn't really meet people uh, aside from this mission. Um, he doesn't, um, like there's no uh, wedding at Cana, right? Jesus turning water into wine. This is John's gospel. And it's a sign of the cross, but it doesn't um, neatly fit. John, John, John is just concerned about two things healing people, and casting out demons. And in fact, in most places in Mark, he's going to call those the same thing. He's going to say Jesus uh, healed the man when he casted out a demon. For Mark, those are the same thing. And that's why we're talking about demons today as part of our Jesus the Healer class. For Mark, these are the same thing. And these are... Uh, the, this is how Jesus is building up his kingdom and tearing down Satan. Uh, there's only three miracles that Jesus performs that don't fit directly into this, but even then it's symbolic. Two of those three is him walking on water and calming the storm. Now, water and storm in Jewish imagination, it's chaos. It's a symbol of the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness. So he's showing his dominion over the kingdom of darkness. The third miracle, the only other miracle, is the multiplication of the loaves. That's going to be his feeding, his bringing together his kingdom. Again, all Jesus is doing, building up God's kingdom, tearing down Satan's. Any questions so far? Correct. When you talk about the Gospels, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, Synoptics, John. So the Synoptics will share a lot of events and, and details, but each of, the, each of the authors will kind of put their own spin on it. Um, it's commonly thought that Mark was the first, and then Matthew and Luke base their accounts on Mark. That's generally how people explain the relationship. Um, that's when Mark was written, and then uh, the, the dating for the other two Gospels kind of varies. Uh, you can have different opinions. Um, and not, not everyone is in agreement about this. Some people think that Matthew wrote first. It's a minority opinion, but it is an opinion. Uh, that's uh, where Mark puts it, yeah. Uh, he's going to put it there, and he's going to put it at his, uh, at his Last Supper. For the synoptics, that's the, kind of their shared um, Eucharistic theology, if you will. Again, building up his kingdom. That is the new covenant. God's covenant, he strikes with his people, makes them into his people. So Jesus, this is his new covenant, his kingdom. And that's why we're talking about Jesus the Healer today. This is an icon uh, that is local. This one is at uh, Resurrection Parish in Tualatin. Uh, Jesus the Healer, which is, again, for Mark, the same thing as Jesus the caster out of demons. So, he gets baptized, he goes out to fight Satan in the desert, and finally the story starts. He comes to the towns. This is when the story starts. What's the first thing he does? He calls his soldiers. The very first thing is him calling uh, the disciples, saying, come follow me, and they drop their nets and follow him. If he's going to do battle, he needs an army. So he, he brings the disciples along. And then the very next thing he does 
It's basically him saying to his disciples, all right, you're following me. Who am I? Watch. I'm going to show you. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Sabbath. We're kind of used to hearing this. We're like, oh yeah, the, the Jews didn't like that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. This is old hat. I want to just stress... Uh, why? Because it's not just like Jesus happens to be healing on the Sabbath, and then the Pharisees are like, hey, and then uh, coming on to him. No, no, no. Jesus knows full well the law. And he knows full well the symbolism of the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is the day of the new creation. He's saying, this is what I have dominion over, and I am choosing to show it, I'm choosing to heal on this day. I'm picking this day to work this miracle. It's almost like he's picking a fight with the, with the Pharisees. He's saying, I know very well what I'm doing. If you have a problem, speak up. And yet, notice that it just says he taught doesn't say a whole lot about what he's teaching or how he's teaching. It just says he taught. Matthew's gospel, of course, is the gospel of the Sermon on the Mount. Basically, the first half of Matthew is just Jesus teaching. Luke is the gospel of parables. Jesus is always telling parables to, per to convey a point. He has some parables in Mark, but it's more like he emphasizes the, the hidden aspect of the parables. For Luke, parables are kind of this artistic way of showing a truth. For Mark, it's more like parables are a way of, of disguising the truth. Some will get it, some will not. And for that matter, whereas Matthew and Luke are kind of teaching about what it means to be a disciple, what it means to follow Jesus, right? Sermon on the Mount is the Beatitudes. They're the guys who come up with the Our Father. Matthew and, Mark, or Matthew and Luke, that's where the Our Father comes from. How to pray, how to live. Moral teachings, uh, sacramental teachings, uh, spiritual teachings. Mark, as far as he's concerned, is just what he's already said. That Jesus comes onto the scene and says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, that's not to say that the teaching isn't important. That's not what Mark is doing. Right? You, sometimes we hear this, especially from uh, evangelical Protestants, uh, that, oh, it, it, it doesn't matter so long as you believe in Jesus. Right? You've heard this before? That's not what Mark is saying. Remember, uh, last time we said that in the early church, you were baptized, and then you were catechized. It was the sacramental grace of baptism that was going to allow you to understand. That's kind of what Mark is doing here. He's, he's not saying the teaching isn't important, but he's saying that that comes later. First, you make your choice, and you join with the kingdom of God, which is the church. And then you get all the teaching stuff. But that should be enough, right? Malachi, everyone's going to be judged, and uh, everybody's going to be saved or condemned. Mark is in agreement here. At the end of the day, you either follow Jesus and everything he teaches, or you don't. So he teaches, and then the crowds are astonished at his teaching. It's an occasion of wonder. It's an occasion of awe. They start to meet Jesus. And even though they haven't said, oh, this is, this, this is the Christ, this is the Son of God, this is the Messiah, they haven't said that yet. But it's impossible to meet Jesus and not have a reaction. Mark is very, very clear on this. There is no neutral encounter with Jesus. Either you are getting closer to accepting him or you are getting closer to rejecting him. And so that's kind of the hanging question. 
they're provoked. But are they going to stick with it or are they going to let it fall away? And it turns out that there's really no neutral reaction. It's the very fact that Jesus is teaching that provokes immediately a man with an unclean spirit. Mark doesn't specify, was, did he come into the synagogue at this time? Was he part of the synagogue and just now spoke up? Did they know he was possessed beforehand? He's showing that it's the teaching of Jesus that provokes the demon. In the man, maybe he was able to hold it. Maybe he was able to kind of keep the demon under wraps until now. But when faced with Jesus, the Son of God, his demons are exposed. There's no hiding. There is only a positive reaction or a negative reaction to Jesus. And what does he say? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So, we can see that the humans don't know what's going on. The humans can't recognize Jesus yet, but the demon does. It's the spiritual plane of combat. He's healing people, he's casting out demons, is what we can see. And we're challenged to look deeper and to see the reality of what's happening, this cosmic battle between heaven and hell, this cosmic battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. But we have to be clear, uh, we have to be clear about this battle because Jesus doesn't answer any of these questions. What have you to do with us? Have you come to destroy us? He doesn't answer any of that. He's not engaging with the demon like an equal. No, no, no. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. The Greek is very forceful. This word rebuked. One possible translation is even more uh, kind of forceful. Be muzzled. Be muzzled. Shut up, you yapping dog. They're, they are not on the same level here. Jesus is telling this demon, shut up. So on the one hand, yes, it's this grand cosmic battle between uh, heaven and hell. But we have to be clear about what is the relationship between heaven and hell. It's not two equal forces of order and chaos. This is a very common uh, thing in Far Eastern religions, right? Taoism, this kind of yin-yang thing. Um, and for a long time, the church had to struggle with this heresy. The church knew it as Manichaeism. It's not important, but just know that the church had to struggle for a time with people thinking it's uh, perfect good versus perfect evil, and there's sort of these equal cosmic forces. No, there's one God. He is good. And this is a renegade creation that is rebelling, but it's just a creature. It's a dog who is barking and yapping and acting up, and I'm going to put this dog down. Yes, it's going to take some effort. And in fact, a lot of, a lot of theology for the first millennium of the church and even beyond was figuring out why, uh, why Jesus had to be crucified, or did Jesus need to be crucified? Was this necessary when God could have just as easily snapped his fingers and said, no more with you. Because he could have. He's God. So it's a question for a long time that the church has to struggle with to say why then did, we have to be, did he have to be crucified. Mark isn't uh, particularly concerned with answering that question of why yet. He's more concerned with what did happen and, and what can I show about what did happen, not so much what could have or what would have happened. Um, even so, even so, he's clear that this is not an equal battle. This is God putting down a renegade creation. And everyone's uh, question. So, Chris, did Paul, one of Paul's teachers say in, I think, the book of Acts about how it was necessary for a man to die for the Jewish believers? 
Yes. Right. So wasn't there any like evidence that it was necessary? Why is it necessary? Yeah. And in fact, Thomas Aquinas uh, will kind of clarify as to what it means to even be necessary, right? Um, so the long and short of it is that when the Bible says necessary, it was necessary that the Christ must suffer, um, we should read that as it was the best way, and God works in the best way. But God could have snapped his fingers. But he didn't, and there was, there's a reason for that. Would he not have to demonstrate that to all of man, um, the learned people of the day who listened and... Stumbling block, right? Yeah, that's straight out of the Bible. ...happened to be there and wanted to hear this person speak. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's... So I say a thousand plus years of theology concerned with why at the cross. And there's no, there's no one answer. And there's, there's almost this... Uh, as Pope Benedict puts it, a symphony of theology. And you hear kind of the different lines that are saying different things, but they're all kind of harmonizing together. Um, as to why uh, it was necessary that the Christ should suffer and die. But the crowd is amazed. So the question among themselves, they are now thinking about this question. What is this? Or better yet, who is this? What is this? A new teaching. With authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Uh, I'm going to pull from a Dr. Mary Healy, because uh, the quote's just too good. Uh, Jesus' teaching is new, not only because it has never been heard before, but because it has the power to accomplish what it communicates. The teaching itself, the revelation of the good news of God and His plan, frees human beings from their captivity to evil. Just like Genesis, right? God spoke and it came into being. Jesus speaks, come out of Him, and it happens. So they're recognizing that there's something about Jesus. The question is, are they going to come to the fullness of the truth? That's the question that's going to follow through the rest of the gospel. Um, but that's, that's Jesus, the healer. For him to heal people is the same thing as for him to cast out demons, is the same thing for him to bring people into the kingdom of God. Straight out of the curriculum. Anyone know who is on, well, I mean, uh, I'll, buy you, I'll, I'll buy you a drink if you can identify the guy on the right. But uh, can, can, uh, can anyone tell me who is on the left at the very least? It's a, a bald guy uh, who, uh, maybe, maybe the writing is a clue. Uh, it says, Ad Maiorum Dei Gloriam, A-M-D-G. This is his motto. St. Ignatius of Loyola. On the right is St. John Cashin. He's not very well known in the West, but he is one of my favorite saints. The reason why I put these saints together is that they are, uh, when they teach about spirits, uh, they're seeing that the word spirit can mean very many things. In the church's vocabulary, when they speak of a good spirit or an evil spirit, um, they, they don't necessarily mean an agent. They don't necessarily mean an angel or a demon, right? A, if you will, a quote-unquote person. Spirit is a more general term. Um, of course, uh, Satan is the father of lies. He's the father of all evil. God does not create evil. So in a sense, ultimately, all, uh, all evil is, is Satan. But uh, neither does that mean, you know, this isn't, the point isn't to get up in alarm and kind of uh, scared of everything in the world. 
Uh, if you remember, I gave a Tuesday talk last month, month before, um, about this. Uh, we, we recognize Satan for what he is, but we don't give him any more or less credit than he deserves. But spirits uh, doesn't have to mean a literal demon, but it can simply refer to an oppressive mood or a feeling uh, in the heart, which is where God speaks to us. So a spirit gets in the way of that. So the talk, both of these saints, Cassian is living in about the year 400, and Ignatius is at the Reformation, so that puts him about the 1600s. So over a thousand years apart, but they share this tradition, they share this, this idea. Uh, they'll, and they'll speak in terms like a spirit of lust, spirit of anger, spirit of gluttony. Anyone recognize these terms? Cashin and his contemporaries, um, those he's, he's living with and writing with, they're called the Desert Fathers. And they call them the nine afflictions of the soul. Eventually through the centuries and from, in the transition from Greek into Latin, that becomes the seven deadly sins. Exactly. It starts with these guys. Well, it starts with Cashin. And Ignatius is kind of picking up the ball. Um, evil spirits. So, spiritual warfare is not just Jesus casting out literal demons. It can be, and that's why the church has exorcists. But, in our own lives, we, we, we take agency. We have to sort of pick up our own cross. And remember that the cross, for Mark, is Jesus' ultimate weapon against the kingdom of Satan. He, he's almost saying, pick up your arms and follow me into this battle. Uh, I think this was uh, out of Father John Ricardo's book that we worked out of. Uh, if you're a World War II history uh, person, um, when all the ships and the allies land on the beaches of France at D-Day, anyone who has eyes to see can see that the war is over at that point. It's won. Anyone with eyes to see can see that it's over. But they still have to work their way through Europe. They still have to finish the job, even though they know they won. And that's kind of where we find ourselves, right? The Gospels are the story of the preparations, if you will, uh, the uh, getting to the point and preparing the way, clearing the beach for the ship to land. And that ship is the cross. He plants it in the sand at Normandy, and he says, the battle is won. But from that point on, Jesus says to each of us, take up your cross and follow me into battle. We still have to finish the job. Fight with me. And so for the spirits in our own lives, the enemies, the agents of the kingdom of Satan, whether they're literal demons, if it's a literal demon, get an exorcist. But uh, for, for the evil spirits in our own hearts that hold us back, we can take agency over these. Because by our baptism, we ourselves are um, configured to Christ. We have his power of being priests, prophets, kings. The dignity, the royal dignity given to us in our own baptism. And so we can take authority we can claim our own hearts, if you will, for the kingdom of God. At every moment in our lives, there's a choice, kingdom of God, kingdom of Satan. And so we reject the evil spirit. We reject the kingdom of Satan. Um, Ignatius has... Maybe you've heard of his 14 rules for discernment. It's his kind of detailed spiritual guide. Our men's fellowship is working through this right now. Um, but it all starts, I think, uh, with Cashin's advice. Uh, and he and the Desert Fathers. Um, it's not the end-all, be-all. You know, they're not saying, oh, this and nothing else. Right? Ignatius is still important. He gives this kind of detailed 14-step guide. 
But the first step, if you will, step zero for a cashin, is trusting in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus has power. And in fact, the name of Mary and the name of Joseph, exorcists will testify, every single one of them, that demons cower at the, at the very name, Jesus, Mary, Joseph. So you're, you recognize the evil spirit for what it is, who it is. For most of us, Satan is not this kind of cartoon demon with a forked tail and hooves that flits around our shoulders. For most of us, the evil spirit actually disguises himself as our own voice, saying, you are not good enough. God does not love you in general. Or more specifically, it's a spirit of one of these nine afflictions, one of these seven deadly sins. Uh, it's this affliction of saying, yeah, just one more piece, one more piece of pie, and then another piece, and then another piece, just one more. It's okay, right? We have to recognize that that's the spirit of gluttony. Or um, when uh, we're angry about someone uh, and something they did, maybe, and maybe it starts as justified anger, but we hold on to that anger and we say, we just let it fester. And uh, we, we allow ourselves to go along with this spirit of wrath. So you recognize the spirit for what it is, and you say, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of, name the spirit. This is Cashin's kind of step zero for spiritual warfare, and I can testify that in my own life, this is, it sounds almost too good to be true, but that's the power of trust and confidence in the name of Jesus. Jesus, in your name, I renounce the spirit. And they go on to say it's, it's kind of like a spiritual judo, um, which we're not used to. Usually our MO in spiritual warfare, even if we don't know it by that name, is to kind of white knuckle it and say, I'm not going to think about this. I'm not going to think about this. And you kind of fight the spirit like that. It doesn't work. You're, you're, you're giving the spirit room. Basically, you're letting Satan, the dog, who needs to be muzzled, kind of play dress up as this grand sort of hulking general. Um, so you, you, you invoke the holy name of Jesus, you renounce the spirit, and then you just kind of go about your business as you were. You don't focus on letting the thought control you. And then in about 30 seconds to a minute, it goes away. Or at the very least, it's hold over you lessons. Um, and I found this to be of great, great spiritual uh, help in my own life. It takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. Is that likened to like temptation instead of like a physical spirit that's attached? It's exactly what I'm saying. It's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Spiritual warfare is not just for exorcists. It's not just for people fighting literal demons. It's for all of us every moment fighting these temptations. They'll call them spirits because it kind of helps with the, with the terminology, helps with the imagery. Even if it's not a literal spirit, don't give it any hold. Don't give it any room. Do we have any knowledge? This is kind of a weird question, but any knowledge of how large the crowds were that Jesus was spoken, speaking to at these different times? Well, um... It depends on the context, right? Because Jesus is teaching two different contexts. Here, he's just in a synagogue. And I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but we could probably have a reasonable guess as to how many people fit in a synagogue at a, diff at a, at a time. And based on where is the synagogue? Is it a bigger synagogue? Is it likely to be a smaller synagogue? Other times, he's gathering great big crowds, right? Sermon on the Mount. Thousands of people. Uh, if you're watching The Chosen, right? Uh, Anyone, anyone watching The Chosen? So yeah, at the, at the very end of uh, season two, it, it, it uh, shows the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's kind of cool to see Jesus walking out from behind this makeshift curtain and seeing, as far as the eye can see, people gathered to listen to him. So you, I mean, 
in a synagogue, it would be perhaps the more learned men. <coughs> or they, I mean, it's just it's interesting to me how how did they know he was going to be there? Did he just start speaking? He just walks up. Yeah. He just walk, and then all of a sudden the crowd. Well, we don't really get the sense of big crowds in Mark. Yeah. Again. Matthew and Luke, Jesus is kind of uh, speaking to the whole world. He's gathering these great big crowds. Mark is kind of this more of a secret mission. He's incognito. He's destroying Satan's kingdom from the inside out. So he's not going out of his way to attract crowds. In fact, he almost prefers. Uh, Anybody. Yeah. Anybody. He's not drawing attention to himself. He's just kind of uh, going directly to the enemy and hitting him where he is. He meets the common man and meets the... Exactly. And of course, he has a very clear preference for one over the other. Um, well, we got a little bit of time, uh, so I'm going to take the time and kind of play around a little bit, uh, because this is not what Mark is kind of focusing on. Mark is focused on this kind of cosmic battle, Jesus versus the demons. But I want to I draw it together. I want to bridge these two sides of literal demons and figurative spirits. Because you go back to the text, you look at verse 24, or rather you start with verse 23. Immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Who's he? So it's clear that Mark, kind of as the, as the verses go on, Mark means the demon. Or at least he primarily means the demon. But does the man have any self-awareness? Does the man have any sort of agency over these words? Or does he hear himself speaking these words? We don't know. When you talk to exorcists, sometimes people will have no clue at all. They'll, they'll throw the demon out and the person will finally wake up and they'll say, where am I? What was I doing? Other times, there's a sort of limited pushback where the person does have at least a sense of self. So if this person has a sense of self, then this is exactly what I mean. This is our spirits. This is our combat. This is us. Because how often in our own lives do we say, what have you to do with me, Jesus? You are the Son of God. You are perfection. You are holiness. You are all good, all powerful. What do you have in common with me? What do you perfection itself have to do with a sinful, rotten, dirty creature like me. Well, he created us, so. Well, we're made in his image. Yeah. So, yeah. We're made in his image. We know that up here. Do we really accept that down here? <laughs> how often? Don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. But how often? Have we put off going to confession because we want to kind of get ourselves in shape first? How often do we say, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to pray yet, or I don't feel like I can pray yet today. I'm feeling, I'm feeling too awful about something I did, something wrong with me. I feel guilty, and I don't want to pray yet. How often? How often are we moved to tears at this specific sin that we just can't get rid of no matter how I try? And when we look to the cross, all we can see is a standard that we failed to meet. And we cry, Jesus, I'm sorry, I'm trying my best, but I just can't do it. I'm not worthy of your love. How often?
So the demon is seeing that in the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God, we have nothing in common. But when Satan is kind of inside out, right? This is Ignatius' uh, contribution to the spiritual warfare. He is very clear that it's not this, ab this kind of cartoon demon floating around. Satan works through our own thoughts. We have to learn to discern in our own thoughts who's actually speaking. Is it me? Is it God? Or is it the enemy? How often do we doubt, even subconsciously, that God's love is truly perfect and unconditional? How often do we set up conditions? We say up here, okay, God, yeah, I get it. I get that you love me unconditionally, but I'm not ready to accept your unconditional love. I'm not worthy of accepting your unconditional love because I feel I have to put up conditions and live up to those conditions before I accept your love. We think that God would love us more if only we prayed more or prayed better or did more or did better or didn't do this sin. We fear that our laziness and our sin turns God away. We fall into even despair, despair that God would really love us at all in the worst cases. What that's saying is that we believe that we have to free ourselves. It's holding on to the hope that we can free ourselves, heal ourselves, and make ourselves whole before God can love us. And that's the voice of the enemy. We have, to, um, we have to learn what it means for God to love us. Because God isn't loving us with human love. He's loving us with godly love. We have to learn what that means. Um, oftentimes people will look at the Old Testament and say to us, Oh, here's your loving God. This is a God of anger, a God of wrath. Um, we have to learn that that anger and that wrath is kind of this biblical way of expressing. Um, it's not literally that God is looking for a reason to punish, but it's God's love. And God's love reacts differently, as you will, uh, when it meets sin and when it meets righteousness. Um, but it's, it's certainly not true to say that God does not love, or He only starts to love with Jesus. Um, more generally, it was Lewis, I think, who said that uh, the best trick that Satan ever played on the world was to convince the world that he didn't exist. That he what? That he didn't exist. Oh. In... In moral theology, the, the guiding principle, this is from St. Thomas Aquinas, going back to even Aristotle, uh, the guiding principle of all moral theology is in the middle is virtue. Virtue is between two extremes. So you have this extreme of not receiving God's love or this extreme of presuming God's love. Sure. You know, I mean, they're not really following God. Well, they're just choosing to, you know, worship themselves. There's a, it's a similar but related attitude. Pardon me? 
It's a similar but related attitude. Um, it's worshiping God in myself, which in the end turns out to be worshiping myself. But back to my point. For those, for those of us, I think it's more common uh, for dedicated uh, Christians to have the opposite problem, where we um, are setting up these conditions for God's love and not allowing God to love us unconditionally. We say we're not worthy of God's love, which is absolutely true. Lord, I am not worthy that you should live under my roof. It's absolutely not true. But it refuses God to meet us in our unworthiness. And that's why Jesus comes to us as flesh. It's why he comes to us and looks this man in the eye this demoniac man, who was all of us in our sins beset by these spirits. And when the man says, what have you to do with me? What do you have in common with me? How on earth could you have anything to do with a sinful creature like me? And by the very fact, by the very fact of his standing before the person in human flesh, because this is God, he has chosen to take human flesh, and this is his answer. I do not need anything to do with you. You're right, I am God. But I have chosen in my free love to have everything with you. I have chosen to take on human flesh, to become one of the human race. I have chosen because of my love to have everything to do with you. And that's why St. Paul says, he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified have all one origin. That is why he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. God is not ashamed to be one of us. Sometimes we're too ashamed to even be ourselves. But God is not ashamed to, to call us brethren. And that is why um, God chooses to become the brother of this demoniac, of this man beset by sin and spirits, Jesus to become the brother of all of us. And he comes to this man as a man to verify that love and to make real that love in joining him to the kingdom of God. And just as he did that 2,000 years ago by taking on incarnate flesh, he does it here every day of the week in the Holy Mass. And here, in fact, thanks be to God, he does it sometimes three times a week in the Sacrament of Confession, where we encounter the sacramental flesh of Jesus Christ, who heals and forgives and restores us to life and brings us into the kingdom of God. It's the same healing love that frees us from our sin. He shows his humility by becoming a man. We show our humility in return by confessing our sins honestly and courageously. And that's when he says the same thing to each of us that he said to that demoniac 2,000 years ago. He looks at us in the eye, seeing every single one of our sins, not ashamed to call us brethren, even seeing those sins. And he looks to us with love and he says to those spirits that haunt all of us, come out of him, come out of her. 
be gone, be muzzled. That's the kingdom of God right here today. The same kingdom that Jesus brought about 2,000 years ago. Any last questions? Let's pray. You think that um, when people get possessed like that, that they have already opened themselves up by not following, like, say, if I don't go to confession or to mass and, you know, commit mortal sin, am I I'm more inclined to be open to no grace from God, no mercy, no grace. I mean, because you know how the priest today said when you give love, you get grace back. The only way you get, something like that, I forget how he said it today in his homily. We have to be careful not to assume too much. You know, an exorcist will start by asking these kind of questions. Um, you know, have you been involved with the occult? Have you been, uh, you know, what's, what's the basic history of your sin? You know, exorcists will start with these questions. But we can't assume those questions, right? We, we can't assume that everyone who um, is beset by a spirit, whether literal or figurative, whether that's a fault of their own sin. We, we, we proved that two weeks ago, two, two sessions ago, right? Did this man sin or his parents? And Jesus says, no one sinned. He's talking about original sin, which does afflict all of us and manifests itself with particular sin with particular spirits, particular demons. Any last questions? Then let's pray. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you would please uh, 